Come on. No, no, it's not treat time. Come on. What's going on, boys? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the vlog. It's good to see you guys. I hope you guys are doing well. Oh, it's another beautiful day in the neighborhood. If you guys are new to the channel, this is my, let me give you a better view of it. This is my 1995 E36 M3 with a bunch of stuff done. A lot of, lots of stuff done over there. Uh, just put a new hood on it, a used new hood, uh, because that hood had a burn uh, that I did with the polisher. Really was bugging me, so I wanted to put a new hood on it. I want to wash it. Uh, because it's been sitting in the garage for a while. It's a beautiful day, so I'll probably do that today. But this car has 236-ish thousand miles. And pretty much the only thing I haven't done to it is change the cabin air filter. I literally, I have no idea when it's been changed. So I'm gonna dip under there. This isn't gonna be an instructional how to do it. I'll probably show you where it's located in case you guys are trying to find it. Uh, but I need to change that because I have no clue how bad it is. And it's got like 240K on it. It could be horrendous. It could be awful. We'll see, it could be clean. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get under there and try and change this and then probably wash the car. Man, I'm not sure what else I got planned for you guys. I'm not sure how I'm gonna edit this. I'm not sure when I'm gonna edit it. I'm tired, I'm tired. Anyway, let's get under the car. All right, so first thing for me, since I have this, I'm going to take it off. There we go. I'm not gonna be stopping no fires today. And then the, the actual cabin air is up there behind the dash. Generally, there's something that sits up there uh, that you would have to take off. I don't have that piece of paneling in, in there anymore. I have it still, but I just don't use it because I'm under here all the time. And then I believe most guys take out the dash or the glove compartment, but I don't think you actually have to. So I'm gonna get under there and see how hard it actually is and see what I have to do to take it out. I was really hoping it would be a lot worse, you know, for the drama. But it's not bad. I mean, it's not great. It's pretty gross, actually. That's pretty, that's pretty gross. I mean, this versus this. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's pretty, that's pretty disgusting. I'll show you how to make this really eat. Oh. I'll show you how to make this really easy after uh, after I get this new filter back in because there's a simple way to do this. All right, so got that back in there. One of the things that I did that made, made this a lot easier was uh, this little piece right here. I don't know if you can see that this right here this main piece it slides on to these little pieces right here you just have to push it up over them and slide it back down so push that up lift it off that gives you a ton more room and now just to get it back on it's just the opposite process you'll see maybe you'll see there's little clips on these that fit into these little rails right there so now I'm just gonna slide that back on tuck everything away nice and neat like and button this job up All right, boys, one thing I wanted to update you on, I got a few questions on, was the windshield wiper fluid delete that I did. Uh, so what I was going to do was just ground or short out the sensor. But what I ended up doing, it made it a lot easier, uh, is I had literally just plugged the sensor back in, uh, the little sensor that goes into the bucket. I plugged that back in and literally just taped the sensor closed. So basically what happens, that sensor has a float attached to it and when there's no fluid in the, um, in the windshield wiper container or fluid container, uh, that sensor is down. 
and then as fluid is added, it floats up and that triggers it, the warning light to go off. So what I did was I just taped that sensor closed basically so the warning light isn't on. So this way I didn't have to short anything, still works and I can just tuck it down out of the way and everything will be fine. So that is good. Also, I went through yesterday and polished this hood. Um, just a, a light polish job. I washed the car and polished it and I want to get it out in the sun because I want to see how everything looks. I mean in here when you look at it over the top everything looks like it matches good. It looks like the car has a little bit more of a shine to it maybe but I want to get it out in the light and actually see what it looks like but there's one more thing I want to do because ultimately what I want to do is set lap times with this car and then compete with the S2000 against the M3 to see how close I can get. Uh, now there are massive differences between the two and massive horsepower differences between the two, but I, I think that'd be a really fun challenge to try and get the S2 uh, NA to compete with this NA. Uh, and then ultimately I plan on supercharging the S2. But anyway, right now I have my front camber set at like negative 2.9 and the rear is at negative like three. Generally speaking, and I just learned this from a couple of good guys, generally speaking, you don't want the front camber to be less than the rear, or to be, le yeah, less than the rear. But the reason my rear is so aggressive is because these tires will rub on the fender if it's any less. So if I straighten it out anymore, then the rears are gonna rub on the fender. So three is about the least aggressive I can be to make it so it doesn't rub and it's not just out of control. So I'm gonna leave this at three, but I wanna make the front like maybe three and a half ish, like negative 3.5, somewhere around there. The problem with the E36, look at this. I can get to this bolt, I can get to this bolt, I can get to this bolt. One <laughs> bolt, ah! So in order for me to adjust the camber, I have to drop the strut. It's so annoying. <laughs> and that's why, oh, those transmissions in my way. That's why when I got this for a corner balance and aligned, they didn't want to adjust the camber anymore because that would have taken them a lot longer. So I do want to adjust the camber a little bit. I am getting a little bit of pushing in the front. So I'm gonna try and adjust it a little bit more than it is currently and see if that helps. So it looks like my project for the day is dropping the struts on each side. It's not a big deal. It's not super hard. Um, just a little annoying. But anyway, let's get to it. So again, step one, take off the wheel. Step two, support the hub. Then step three, you're gonna come up here and loosen these. Step four, you're going to loosen or you're gonna remove the sway bar in link nut so you can push the sway bar in link out of the support. All right, step whatever, because I forgot, with the sway bar in link loosened and pushed through, I can now take off the strut tower support and then that will give me access to these to adjust the camber. All right, once you had that dropped and you dropped the strut, then you can loosen those bolts like I did and you can tighten them back up to where they are. Now you see it matches the spec on the other side and we should be good to go. Step whatever, whatever, and whatever, lower the car and we're good. <laughs> I mean, honestly, for me, the way this is set up, it's really not hard. That lens looks mad dirty. Hold on, guys. <laughs> Nothing like a professional lens cleaning, eh? <laughs> All right, so that definitely made a difference. You can just tell visually looking at it. There is a lot more camber in those guys. I think that's going to be good. So. For my setup, the suspension I'm running, how it's done, oh, you can't see me. It's pretty easy to do. It that took me probably about an hour to do-ish by myself, which, you know, it really, really helps to have an impact driver to loosen those strut uh, camber adjustment bolts, because without it, the top spins, so it's kind of hard. Uh, so that really helps. And it's honestly, if you don't have an impact driver, 
save yourself some hassle and go get one. It's almost like having a second set of hands. It really, really helps. Um, lastly, lastly, and this is gonna do it for this video. I got the clutch for the S2000 and I got motor mounts, trans mounts, and basically everything needed to get the motor in the car. It's Valentine's Day today, so I don't think I'm gonna do that today because I probably wouldn't have a Valentine's Day with someone next year if I did that. So I'm probably gonna spend the rest of the day with a significant other having a wonderful Valentine's Day. But I think this weekend, I'm gonna try and make some major progress on getting the S2000 motor installed. So if you're new to the channel, guys, smash that subscribe button. Um, I'm gonna be doing more track days with the M3 and the S2000, I don't think we're that far away from starting it up. We're gonna be, we're nowhere near finished. I have suspension that I need to install. I think I want a spoon big brake kit or the spoon rotors. I gotta do a new top install. There's a lot to be done but it's gonna be awesome. So smash that subscribe button. I appreciate you guys watching and I will see you in the next video. Peace.